Hi, I'm Peter Arcara, and this is USD with Solaris Basics. In this course, we'll explore the Solaris UI, we'll begin a discussion about what USD is, we'll learn how to manipulate objects in the Solaris viewport, and then finally, we'll import SOPS geometry into Solaris and render it using Karma. Our goal for this course is to introduce you to the concepts of USD and how it's implemented in Houdini using Solaris. Let's get started. So let's begin our course on USD basics by talking first about terminology. So there's three overarching terms that you'll hear quite a bit as we talk about USD. The first of those is Solaris, and that's an umbrella term for all of the tools within Houdini that work with USD. The next term that you'll hear often is stage, and that's the context name that we're working within. This is really similar to anything that you might be used to in Houdini, such as the object context or material context. Finally, we have LOPs, which is what we call the nodes that we're putting down onto the stage. Uh, and these are what we use to actually compose our USD scene as we go through our network. So let's talk about what Solaris is. Solaris is our scene building, lighting, layout, and pipeline tool. Pretty much any time that you're working with USD within Houdini, you're going to be working in Solaris. It's also a place where we can render through Hydra Delegates. Um, our Hydra Delegate that we've created at SideFX is Karma, and that is our, our proprietary renderer that we use within Solaris. Um, but you can also use other Hydra Delegates from third parties like Arnold, RenderMan, Redshift, V-Ray. That's just to name a few, but we'll mainly talk about Karma, and even at that, we won't really go too deep into rendering within the scope of this course. So what is USD? Uh, USD stands for Universal Scene Description, and it's, it's a file format that was created and maintained by Pixar. Um, it is a way that you can collaborate simultaneously in many different departments and with many different artists without causing conflicts of files or names or things like that. It allows you to kind of non-destructively work together. Uh, it's also an interchange file format that allows you to move from one um, content creation tool to another uh, and take your entire scene with you and all the elements that go along with it. And finally, it's also a software platform. So it means that you can you can make changes to the way that it works and, and build on top of it um, to meet the needs of your production, whether that's a small or a large scale production. So finally, let's talk about what a primitive is in the context of USD. So in USD, almost every object is considered a primitive, whether it's a light, geometry, a camera, shaders, or render settings. All of those things are considered primitives. And really what a primitive is, it's just a word. It's just a way of saying this is a thing in USD. And these are all, all these primitives are the things that we're going to author and manipulate and edit throughout the course of this process of creating a USD scene. So any preconceived notions you might have of the word primitive, let's just set those aside as we move forward into working in USD. Let's define a few online locations that you can look to for resources as you go through this course on USD. First off, let's, let's talk about the Pixar USD documentation. This is kind of the gold standard online for what USD is and how to work with it. Uh, they have different terms and concepts that they define. There's tutorials, uh, there's some downloads that you can get, and even some API documentation if you wanna really work and kind of extend what USD can do for you. Next, let's take a look at the LOPS and USD glossary on the side effects website. Uh, this is found in the documentation under Solaris, and it's a glossary of terms that are just related to LOPS or USD in general. So let's take a look at how this works. Under glossary here, you can see there's a little filter section, and we can filter out for a result something like USD. And here we have a nice description on what USD is and how it relates uh, within Houdini. And then if we also wanted to search for something like a prim, here we can find some different information about that and they define a prim for you and kind of how that works within USD. So this is a really great way to be able to search for things really specifically and quickly. Now, another great place to find resources is the talks and webinar section of the Side Effects website. And this is a collection of videos that are put together by Side Effects and they cover a wide range of topics and industries and have come from a bunch of different events over the years. So for example, if we wanted to look for videos on Solaris and USD, we could come onto this part of our website, click on the drop down, go down to Solaris, and we can see all of the videos that have to do specifically with USD and Solaris.
The last place I'd like to bring your attention to is the tutorials section on our website. And this is very similar to the talks and webinars section that we just brought up, but it actually has videos from all over the web and they are categorized for you to be able to search through. So if we go here to the top bar, we can look at the categories and we can just scroll down to Solaris, click that. And now we have a filtered list that are videos that relate to Solaris and USD. I'll be putting these links at the bottom of the course page on Houdini Insight. If you scroll down past the videos, you'll see a resource section that'll have these websites listed. These are all great places to help you expand your knowledge of USD and Solaris. All right, let's jump into the Houdini interface and look at the USD import and export SOP. In the example file that we've provided for you, if you navigate here to the stage, you'll see the um, that there's separate sections that are created for each chapter in this course. Uh, the first one we're going to be looking at is the USD import export SOP section right here. Uh, just before we get into that, though, I want to bring your attention over here to another node. Uh, that's the cook all ROPS node. And this is something I've created just so you can right click here and say cook output node. And that's going to save all of the USD files that you need for this course uh, onto disk for you. So then you'll just be able to follow along um, easily while uh, going through these courses. So let's come back up here to section four and we'll jump into this SOP network. Um, so in this network, we have three different pieces of geometry that are created. We have a toy, Tommy, and a pig. And so each of these gets an attribute. Um, this is a name attribute on the polygons here. This is a name attribute of Tommy on these polygons. And this one has a name attribute of pig on those polygons. And we merge them all together here and then send them into this USD export node. And what this is gonna do is output a USD file for us. Uh, there's not a ton of options here. There's a few little things here and there that you can go into, but from just a really basic standpoint, um, we can just point to a file and say save to disk and it'll write a USD file right onto disk. And I have it set up to save out to this geocache for folder, which is right here. This is the file. And if we open it up in a text editor, uh, we can see that there's a whole bunch of information that gets saved out. And you don't have to worry about right now what all this what all this means. Um, but just understand that if you look at kind of a very basic level, we can see that there's three meshes that are defined. Pig, Tommy, and Toy. And so that means that the USD file has seen those, those um, named attributes that we've created and kind of separated our geometry into three pieces. So now when we come over to the import USD section here, we can point to that same file on disk and it'll import all of our data here. You can see all of our, our geometry is on the screen. Um, however, if we middle click here, we can see that everything, there's just one of everything and it's one packed USD. Basically that means that it's just all of the geometry data is just, is just put onto one point and then we can manipulate that all. So it's kind of a way to save um, memory and, and um, you allow Houdini to be able to work a little bit more efficiently if we want to bring in this one um, USD file. But let's say we wanted to separate each of these uh, USD primitives that we named and the export stage here. Well, we can use this node right here, the unpack USD node. And what this is going to do is actually unpack it to these three um, USD primitives that we created. You can see right here, we now have three packed USDs. And if we look over here on this, we can see that there's pig, Tommy, and toy. So these have been separated into each of their primitives that we had named earlier. And um, now we can manipulate these on, on uh, as individual geometries at this level. Um, but if in Houdini we wanted to get all of our geometry back and be able to do um, you know, manipulation on the point level or individual polygon level, if we use another uh, unpack USD to polygons, um, this will now convert it all to editable uh, geometry. And if we middle click here, we can see we have all of that geometry data back um, and able to be done with in Houdini what we'd, what we'd like to do with it. And at this point, you're probably saying, well, this is very similar to the way that something like an Alembic file might work or an FBX file or a BGEO, if you're familiar with Houdini. And from a geometry standpoint, that's true. But what you'll see in the coming uh, chapters and courses is that we can actually 
define much more than just individual sets of geometry inside of our uh, USD file, we'll actually be able to, to spe specifically talk about you know, cameras, shaders, render settings, all different types of things that lets us kind of go beyond what a, a traditional geometry cache format might be and be able to start to define our entire scene and really build up on top of that and create these really robust things that we can then pass down the line uh, to different departments or different artists and be able to edit them. So this is just the real basic introduction to what a USD coming in and out of Houdini looks like. And in the coming chapters, we'll talk a little bit more about um, ways that we kind of build on top of that. Now that we've seen how to write USD files, let's look at the formats and extensions that are available in USD. So the three extensions that are available to be written to are .usd, .usda, and .usdc. Now, you can simply add any of these extensions to your save path in any USD export node and have it write one of these different formats to disk. So with .usd, it defaults to binary, but it can also be ASCII as well. Uh, with .usda, it'll only be an ASCII text file. And with .usd, it'll only be a binary or crate file. And so this is just kind of a something you want to keep in mind when you're saving, you're writing your save path so that you know what your options are with each of these different uh, extensions. So the two different formats that we have available within um, USD are binary or ASCII. And so the binary is also sometimes referred to as a crate file. Uh, that's where we get the USDC um, extension. And so the two benefits to this are we get faster file reads and smaller files. Now, the one negative is that it's not human readable because it's written in binary. But this file format is really best for having, you know, large geometry, large assets, or even simulations or things like that that might be just a ton of data that you're writing to disk and need to get quickly. Um, that's where binary is really most useful. And then conversely, uh, ASCII text files, uh, they, the two negatives that they have is that they have slower file reads and larger files. But the huge upside is that you're actually able to read them and get inside of these files and see what's happening in there. So these are really best for simple scenes or assets, things that aren't going to require a ton of data, but that you might want to be able to get inside of and look at what's going on in there. Now, in the example file that we provided, uh, I want to just bring your attention to how we actually take a scene and write it to each of those file extensions. So we're going to open up this USD extensions uh, node here, go inside. There's a rubber toy and a grid defined in here. And we have four different USD outputs that we uh, create from this. Now, in this chapter, we're only going to talk about the first three. So the first one is going to write a USD binary file, and that's just writing it as an extension scene.usd. The second one is going to write as a USD and an ASCII. So this is going to be extension scene.usda. And the third one is going to write extension scene.usdc. So this is going to be the crate binary format. So when these are all saved to disk, um, they will get written out into the scenes folder. Uh, and here you can see the, uh, the three files that I just mentioned, the USD file, the USDA file, and the USDC file. Now the last one we'll talk about in the next chapter, but um, these three files are all uh, identical as, as far as what's inside of them, but you can tell that the USDA file is a little bit larger. And if we open it up, we'll see that it is in ASCII format and it has a couple different sections to it. Uh, the top section kind of defines the scene. And then these sections here uh, define those two components, the rubber toy and the grid. Now, this might seem like a lot of information and like you're really overwhelmed with what's on screen here and just even the simple scene. And that's fair. And we will break down all these different parts and pieces as we're writing USD. But just know that this is specifically what USD looks like when it's written on disk. It comes in as text files if you write it as an ASCII format. And this is what we can use to then analyze uh, what's being written to disk down the line. So lastly, let's talk about uh, the .usd file format and how you can convert between binary and ASCII. So if you're using command line tools, you can use one of the USD command line tools that they, they give you that's usd cat and allow for a 
uh, an option to be passed into the command line and switch between binary and ASCII file formats. And so the real great thing about this is that if you have um, a file path downstream at an artist or in another department that's looking for that file, um, you can actually change it to an ASCII file, make sure that everything's right inside of it, and then switch it back to a binary file without breaking links to other people and other departments down the line. So this is like a really great thing to keep in mind when you're working with specifically .usd files. Let's talk about how we can write a .usd file directly to the ASCII format. So as we talked about previously, a .usd uh, extension can be either binary or ASCII. Now it defaults to binary, but what if we wanted to actually write directly to an ASCII text file? Well, the answer is to append a string to the end of the USD file path. And that string is what we see right here is colon SDF format args, colon format equals USDA. And so if you add that string to the end of a file path, that will save a .usd file as an ASCII format. So let's take a look at what that looks like over in Houdini. In the example file that we provided, uh, there's this USD extension subnetwork. And if we dive into that, we can see a uh, small scene that we created, and it just simply has a rubber toy and a grid inside of it. And it writes out to a few different uh, USD ROP nodes. And the first three we've talked about already, but let's talk about this last one here. This is the, uh, this is the node that allows us to write a USD file, uh, but that's in the ASCII format. And so if we look at the output file, the first part of it is a .usd file that we're writing here. And the last part is that string that we append to it that tells it to be a USDA format. So let's take a look at what that actually does. So let's look at the scenes folder and we can see here that there is a extension scene ascii.usd and that's identical in size to the extension scene.usda. So here's the USD file that we've wrote as ascii and you can see obviously that we can identify all the information inside of it and if we check this against the other file that we had written originally it's identical. So this is a way that you can force a .usd file to be um, an ASCII format by just using this simple um, uh, string to append at the end of an output file path. So I'd like to talk about USD on a more conceptual level and try to uh, bring some parallels to some other file formats that are in use today. So when we think about USD, we can draw a few parallels between it and other file formats that are created at render time uh, by different renderers that exist. So first of all, like we can t we can look at SideFX's Mantra, um, and it uses .ifd files to write the scene to disk. Um, and then RenderMan uses .rib files, and Arnold uses .ass. Now there's obviously more renderers out there and more file formats that they use, but you can see how the this is a very fractured system of having each renderer have some sort of file type that's associated with it that renders the scene uh, that you're outputting from your software. And so these files, they actually define the scene that we're looking at, right, that we're using. It has all the geometry, the lighting, shaders, and render settings all bundled in them. So when we go to render an, an image in any one of these renderers, we're basically taking the whole scene, writing it to disk, and then we're, the renderer is reading that file off of disk and rendering out the final image. So USD is unique because it is a very similar uh, structure to how it's done. We're, we're kind of composing the scene, we're getting ready to, we're writing it to disk, and then a uh, renderer, and with side effects, our renderer that we're using now with USD is Karma, um, and we're sending that USD file into Karma to be rendered. But USD is really special because it can also be shared between other software packages and it can also interface with any supported renderer that exists out there. Now you do need to define shaders for those different renderers that might be different, but those can all be packaged in the same USD file so that you could easily switch between renderers um, and then also switch between software packages that are reading this file and using it. So that's really the power that USD brings to, the, to this workflow and how you can have a file that's really ready to be rendered, but also can be adjusted and added to um, all the way down the line to final render. All right, so let's take a look at the Solaris interface and see some of the unique panes that we can use to build our USD assets or scenes.
So we're in the scene graph tree and scene graph details section of our example file. And the layout's a little different than what it was like before. Uh, and to do that, I went up here and selected Solaris for the desktop. And so that'll set up these panes uh, the way they are here. Um, and that way you can see all of the necessary things to, to be able to kind of fully uh, understand what's going on with your USD files and understand what Solaris is doing to build those USD files. So in our section here, uh, we have two different nodes. We have a green sublayer node, and this loads our scene uh, that we're gonna use to kind of investigate the scene graph tree over here. Uh, but if you want to actually get to the, the um, network that creates this scene, we can go into the gray node. And here are all the different elements of the scene that are built up. And we have a simple flat scene render down here at the bottom. This is a USD ROP. And if for some reason uh, it isn't saved to disk already, you can use this to, to save it to disk. So Let's go to our sub layer, select it, and make sure the display flag is on, and then head over to the scene graph tree here. So we can see that five primitives are on the top level of our scene, and that's how we set it up um, in, in our create simple scene sub network. And there are two different primitive types that are being loaded here. One is a scope, and one is an X form. And these are basically the most simple types of um, primitives that are made in USD. Uh, they, they are simply, um, a way to be able to kind of collect other primitives beneath them. Um, it's an organizational tool for your hierarchy. And so these are kind of your basic building blocks of your uh, hierarchy in USD. And so the scope primitive type uh, won't actually save any transformation data to it. So that's why something like your render settings have a scope primitive up above them. And something like a camera has an X form primitive because that can save transformation data on it. So obviously you're going to be moving a camera around. So X form is the appropriate um, parent primitive type to use for that. So let's expand the hierarchy and take a look inside here. So we'll just hit these little pluses expand our hierarchy and we can see that there's some other um, child primitives underneath those top levels. Um, we have some lights here, materials, uh, a couple geometries. Uh, we have a basic camera and some render settings. And I'm gonna come up here and hit H to be able to zoom out and kind of frame everything up in our viewport. And so let's take a look at what these columns each mean. So this, this first column is just the name of the primitives. So this is kind of where you can see your hierarchy and where the name of your primitives are um, kind of being displayed. Uh, the next column here is the primitive type. Uh, you can see that there's a bunch of different primitive types that exist, um, you know, different light primitives, camera primitives, render settings, things like that. So there's a whole list of those and we're not gonna go through every single different type, but just know that that's where you can find what kind of primitive these are. Next, you'll see a, a column that says how many descendants there are, basically how many child uh, primitives there are of the specific primitive you're looking at. So in this case, the whole scene, there are 25 uh, child primitives of the entire scene. And you can kind of get the gist from there. Lights, there's five child primitives uh, underneath it. And um, yeah, that's pretty straightforward, not, not too uh, complicated to understand that. Uh, this kind column, we will get to some of that later on, but just know that this is, these are you know, very specific types of uh, primitives that are created in USD, and we'll go over what you know, a component is and things like that. So um, that's where the kind of primitive that you are putting into your scene will be displayed. And then at the end here, there's some uh, toggles that you can use. So we could use this lights primitive for an example, and we can use this to set it at, to deactivate that primitive. You can see there's no lights in the scene now at all, or we can make it active. Uh, so that's what this kind of power button icon does. Then we have the visibility icon here, so we can make it invisible to the scene. However, you can see that these are still loaded in the viewport. You can still see them here. And uh, we can obviously toggle that on and off. Uh, this next column is the solo column. So if I solo the lights, you can see that we just have our lights in our scene. And you know this background is from our HDRI. And we can turn that on or off. And then the very last column here just basically allows us to either make have it be selectable in the viewport, which is the white version, or black, which means you can't actually select these objects in the viewport. So that's kind of a nice little way to kind of lock down uh, so you don't tweak something that you don't mean to. So um, 
The last thing I kind of want to touch on in this uh, scene graph tree, now there are a lot of different icons up here, and we'll get into what some of these do a little bit later um, as we start kind of unpacking more and more about USD. Uh, one of the really helpful things uh, to know about is this gear icon, and we can see that there's a there's a few different columns that we can actually add or remove uh, from our scene graph tree. So the one that's kind of interesting is you can turn the material uh, column on, and we can look and see if there's anything that has a material applied to it. And sure enough, I'm pretty, these geometries should have a material assigned to it. So we can see that this mesh has the ground material assigned and this sphere has the sphere material assigned. And those are right down here. So that's kind of just an overview of what the scene graph tree is. And in the next section, uh, we'll talk about the scene graph details and go into how that works specifically. Now let's take a look at the scene graph details panel that's in our Solaris desktop. So the scene graph details is this pane right here. Uh, and we can kind of use this in conjunction with our scene graph tree. I'm gonna make it a little bigger so we can see it just slightly better. And let's select one of our primitives here. So if we select something like our camera, we can see that these um, properties all update and show what the you know what properties are saved on this specific primitive. So for example, we have things like f-stop, focus distance, focal length, uh, things that you'd expect obviously to be on a camera primitive uh, in your scene. Or we could select the render settings and find all of these karma settings that got that got set in uh, the the simple scene creation that we had created here. So these are all of our karma settings. And if we go down to something like our key light, we can see that now there's there's appropriate properties for that, like intensity, uh, the specular, things like that. So um, that's kind of how you can select one individual primitive and see the um, properties change here. Now, say we had something like a mesh that we wanted to look at and we wanted to find even more details about that we know that that it has points but what are those values of those points if we select that property here we can see that this value um, tab gets gets propagated with all of the point information uh, for that mesh so we can see the actual positions of every point in this mesh so that's kind of even another layer deep that you can use the scene graph details pane to drill down into so let's say we wanted to um, kind of compare these lights against each other. We might select, you know, shift click and select all of these lights here. Well, it's kind of hard to see that, but here we have a few more selections that have been made, but it's kind of tricky to compare and contrast in this tree view like this. So let's change it over into a spreadsheet view like this. And you can also change this either way. Uh, yours might show up like this to start, but we can use this horizontal um, layout to kind of give us ourselves a little bit more room. So now we can really easily uh, compare and contrast what these different lights are doing in the scene. So if we scroll over a little bit, uh, we might see something like the color temperature of these lights. And we can see that they're all at 6,500K. Um, but if we wanted to find something more specific um, across all of these lights, uh, we could use this little filter tab here and we could look at something like the exposure. And now here we can see the exposure across all of these lights and tell that our HDI is is kind of the least um, influential in this scene and we're using you know our key and our top lights and our back lights a little bit more so this is kind of a quick way that you could you know highlight a specific part of your uh, scene and get some information about it uh, really quickly using the combination of the scene graph tree and the scene graph details panes so some usd terms are very similar so let's let's try to clear up any confusion around primitive terminology so here are three common terms that might be confusing at first when you just see them on their own. Um, a leaf primitive might not have an obvious meaning, um, and the words type and kind are very similar words in English. So let's try to give them a little bit more context when working with them in USD. So a leaf primitive is the end of a branch of the scene graph tree. Uh, you can see here uh, in this reference um, which are the leaf primitives just by them being named as leaf. Um, another way of saying that a leaf primitive is the end of one of these these uh, hierarchy branches is saying it doesn't have any child primitive. So you can see here that each of these leaves uh, don't have any primitives that fall underneath them, whereas things like these twigs and branches do have uh, these leaf primitives below them. And in fact, even the trunk has multiple branches below them. So um, we can see here that uh, 
leaf primitives can be at the same level uh, as another uh, branching primitive uh, might be at. For example, um, branch two, uh, under branch two, there's the leaf one and twig one. Those are both at the same level. Uh, but the twig is not a leaf because it has two more primitives below it. Um, so that's really the main difference between any of these branching kind of hierarchical uh, primitives and the leaf primitive. So when we say we're selecting a leaf primitive, we just mean that we're selecting the very end of one of these hierarchy paths. Now, primitive types, uh, they define what a primitive is. And I guess another way of saying it is that this definition gives uh, USD kind of a concrete idea of what the primitive will be used for. Um, some examples that you might might be uh, obvious to you at first, or maybe not, um, are a mesh. A mesh, um, any type of geometry would be considered a mesh. Uh, there could also be something like a parametric geometry that would be something that you basically, it just creates a sphere for you, or a cone, or a cube. Um, there's a few more that are that exist in USD, but those basically you say, give me a sphere um, primitive, and it'll give you a sphere, and you can kind of set the scale, the radius, things like that. Um, another primitive type, kind of that's a grouping of them, is lights. So it might be a dome light, a disk light, a point light. They all have different uh, parameters and things like that that you can set on them, but uh, obviously they're all lights and they're all primitive types. Another thing is if you bring a volume into... Um, Solaris or USD, that's going to be represented as an open VDB. Uh, that's another primitive type that you could set. Uh, render settings are also stored as a primitive type. Um, and uh, point instancer is another version of a primitive type uh, that you could set uh, in USD. So these are all things that you can kind of define um, in your primitive. And we will get to how this works a little bit later in the course. Um, but these are all things that you can kind of uh, set on your primitives and set their type to one of these. So finally, let's talk about kind. Uh, when you set a primitive's kind, that allows you to define uh, kind of where your primitives are going to go in your scene hierarchy. It's not something that is maybe set in stone, but it's it's guidance for where these primitives live. Um, on the left side of this slide, you can see the icons uh, for the different kinds, and they match the list from top to bottom. So the first one is an assembly, and that's just an important grouping uh, of primitives. It's usually a published asset or a reference to one, um, and this is just, it doesn't have to be the top level of your scene, but it's kind of the highest importance in your scene as far as um, assets may go. And um, next up is group. Now, group is the most common one that you'll see to allow you to uh, create your hierarchy, and this can contain components, groups, or assemblies. It's really the most flexible of all of them. Uh, component, that's um, something that can't contain groups or assemblies, so that's a little bit more restrictive. And that's where, um, that's kind of how things will be built um, when you bring them in through maybe like uh, from your SOP geometry or maybe from a file on disk. Uh, those will come in as a component most of the time. Uh, so this is something you'll see that's very common uh, on your scene graph tree and a lot of the smaller detailed uh, primitives like sm um, smaller assets that you bring into your scene will usually be components. Um, and these are only able to contain subcomponents. Uh, they don't have to contain a subcomponent, but um, that's something that uh, they're only able to contain. So then a subcomponent is kind of an important primitive inside of this component, and that's that's kind of the, the difference between that and maybe anything else that might be inside of a component. Um, so from that sense, um, you might have something like a door pivot, like the position of a door pivot that you might want to set in there, and that could be a subcomponent and give um, people kind of a visual um, indication that, hey, this is kind of an important primitive inside of this uh, component that you might want to be able to tweak or change, animate, things like that. So that's kind of the rundown of the different kinds. So let's take a look at the next slide and see some um, ex an example of hierarchy. So here's that example, and it's uh, got a few different named uh, primitives in here. This is sort of a way that you could visualize your scene graph tree would look. Um, let's kind of start with the uh, the assemblies first, since those are kind of the top importance. So you can see here, those are actually kind of on the inside of this uh, hierarchy. You've got the lady and the dog that are both assemblies. Um, those are both maybe published assets on disk that we've loaded onto the stage. Um, and these assemblies contain two components each. Uh, they both both contain a skin component and one contains a person, one contains a collar. And all of those components um, have meshes inside of those. Now those aren't subcomponents, they're just another primitive, they're just a mesh primitive that's inside those components. Uh, so we know that that's just kind of a generic uh, geometry primitive that's inside of there.
So now both of these assemblies, we can see are grouped underneath characters. And that is using obviously the group kind. Um, and that says that we have a couple assemblies inside of there that are grouped under characters. And then finally, characters and props are grouped inside of models. So you can see here that you have these assemblies that are kind of set inside of different hierarchies. Um, so it doesn't always mean that an assembly has to be up at the top or really high in your hierarchy, but we know that the lady and the dog are both kind of these, these assets that have been created and have their components inside of it that are built, and those are kind of ready to go, um, ready to be put into a scene, and then we can group those together as needed with different, uh, maybe different things coming from other departments or different um, elements of the scene. So this is kind of an understanding of how our different kinds are used uh, in, the, in the larger scope of a scene. So as we've been navigating through the Solaris interface, uh, you might have noticed a few different locations where colors come up on primitives uh, or maybe on attributes. So I wanna break those down a little bit for you and make some more sense of what those colors mean. So in this color meaning section uh, of the network, uh, you can select this reference node and click the visibility flag here. And this is gonna load just a small section of that previous scene that we were working in. Uh, it's just gonna basically bring in the geometry. And if we click on this button here, it'll load a legend that'll show kind of the color coding that primitives might use in this view. And so we can see that one of them has color here, the simple flat scene. And that's basically just telling us that, hey, this is just a small piece of this USD file that's been kind of loaded onto our stage. So we're not taking the entire uh, USD file like we were in the previous example. We're just taking a small section of it and bringing it in. Uh, there's a couple other things here you might notice, like instance is used a couple times. Uh, as we get further in the course, you'll know what those mean. Um, and the payloads, that will become clear in a little, a little while as well. But um, the only other thing that I really want to touch on at this moment is the viewport overrides. Whenever we make a change to these columns here on the very far right, you'll see these little red dots show up. And basically that just means that we're overriding something in the viewport. Um, so in this case, we're turning off the sphere, making it non-selectable, things like that. So it's just basically an override uh, notification that you've done something here. So let's hide that. And we'll come over to the scene graph details and talk about this a little bit. So we'll select the mesh. And this has quite a few uh, attributes on it that we can investigate. And so let's slide this over, just to make it a little easier to see what we're doing here. And similarly, it has a button here that's got the little question mark, and that'll bring up a legend for this pane. And we'll talk through these a little bit more because um, these are kind of easily understandable at this point in time. Uh, so you can see here, if we have purple, that means it's a computed value, which basically just means, hey, we're computing maybe, maybe where it is in the scene, or you know, if it what it's bounding boxes. Those are things that just automatically get computed by uh, Houdini and in the Solaris viewport here. So um, then we can see things like this that have no value. Those are gray. So like here, there's no acceleration information. Um, there's no uh, display color on them. So anything that's grayed out like that just basically means there aren't any values on them. Uh, yellow is saying that these are basically like values that uh, it needs to be able to view in the viewer, but maybe it doesn't have to have a set. So these are basically like fallback values, which means that like, hey, at, at very least, this, in, this geometry needs this value set on it. Um, then we can see that there's things that are in light blue here. So things like the points have a default value, which basically just means a non-animating value that's written to it. It's a little bit... Um, it's a little bit of a strange name, but uh, basically it just means this is what a non-animating value is, is a default value. Uh, we don't have anything that's time sampled or any value clips in here because nothing's animated. Um, so when we get a little bit further in the course, you'll see some things that have pink um, or green in them if they're moving around in the scene. But the other thing you'll see here is there's also this relationship color. And that's for things like proxy prims um, or bind, binding materials to a piece of geometry. So anytime you see something like that, that'll be setting some sort of a relationship. Uh, so that's just a real quick way that you can kind of go in and see what um, these specific uh, colors mean in your panes. Now, if you are even unsure about maybe what some of the buttons or anything like that might be in these um, in these separate panes, you can use the little question mark here as well. And this will bring up a whole slew of information about the different icon meanings 
and uh, what the different, some of the terms are and things like that. So uh, this, these are really helpful if you have a really specific question about this. Uh, these, these little question marks uh, can be really, really helpful to be able to dive into that. Um, so that's kind of an overview of some of these um, panes that you have specially in Solaris. And next we're gonna talk a little bit more about working in the Solaris viewport. So in this chapter, we're gonna go over how the Solaris viewport works and some of the nuances that you'll find there. So first of all, in our example scene, let's go to the basic Solaris viewport manipulation section, and we'll just toggle on our uh, display flag and select this node here that's gonna load our manipulation geo. This is the same uh, simple scene.usd that we have. Uh, used in the previous chapters, and uh, it has, you know, a camera, some geometry, lights, things like that in it. So let's first talk about how to select things in the viewport. So we're going to hit S to go into selection mode, and up at the top here, these are all filters that we can use to help us select uh, specific items in the viewport. So here, these allow you to select what type of primitive you're selecting. So for example, this is our geometry, so we'll only select geometry in this case. Uh, this is for lights, so if we select everything, we'll only get the lights selected. This one's cameras, so again, cameras, and this will select lights and cameras. So that's a way to kind of filter by this primitive type uh, column right here. There's also a way to select what kind of primitive you're looking at here. So these are all different kinds of primitives. And then these are kind of where they sit in the in the depth of the tree. So we can select just leaf primitives. So if we do that, that'll only select, for example, like a top light here or the mesh that'll only select the sphere, it won't select anything above it. But if we did the X form primitives, that'll select the top level uh, geometry. So if we did this sphere, we're gonna only select the geo um, X form primitive that's up at the top level here. So that's a way to kind of control um, what kind of primitives you're selecting in your scene. I'm gonna go back to leaf primitives for right now. These just allow you to uh, kind of draw selections differently, whether it's a box, a lasso, a brush, uh, things like that. That's Those are ways that you can do your selections uh, in the viewport. And then this last toggle here is kind of the other important one. And this allows you to only select things that are visible. So like just the sphere gets selected, or if we toggle that off, it'll select everything that is behind this box selection that I'm drawing. So in that case, I even got the HDRI that's kind of sitting down here below the sphere. So that's the way that we can uh, kind of filter our selections. But once we've made those selections, then uh, what can we do in the scene? So let's go back to this and we'll change it to X form primitives. And I'm gonna select this top light here. And that's gonna select just this lights primitive that's on top of all of these uh, different light primitives. So let's hit T to make transform. And you can see that that added an edit node here. And now when I move this around in the viewport, that's gonna move all of my lights because it's transforming all of these lights that are uh, leaf primitives below this top one. So we can change that. And then if we toggle the bypass flag, that'll move our lights back to where they were previously. So this allows it to be a non-destructive edit. It's not changing anything really in the, in the base USD file. It's just creating something over top of it basically. So we'll move that. Let's look at how, um, we might move our geometry in the scene. So let's hit S again to select, and we will select the geometry here and here. Now, in this case, I actually wanted it to select the leaf primitives. So let's go up here, select leaves, and select those again. There we go. Now we have mesh zero and sphere. And so if we hit T for transform, we can move these up and we could rotate them and we could scale them. We could also, instead of selecting them both, we could select just one of them and transform that as well. So if we did move, we could move that over here. We could hit S again and hit R for rotate and just move this around a little bit. And so these moves uh, are all saved in an edit node as well. And you can see here are the two different primitives that we've changed and here's all the transformation information. And we can toggle that bypass flag again and that'll turn it on and off. So let's remove that. Now things are a little different when we select lights, for example. If we select this light up here at the top and hit T, you can see that it adds this light mixer node um, 
basically that's a little bit more in depth than what we're going to cover in this uh the the topics of this course but uh, just know that that's where it's saving uh automatically saving this positional information that i'm putting into it um so as i translate that and hit the bypass flag here you'll see it jump you know from that position and back to its ori original position and then finally if we select our camera and hit T for transform and start manipulating this a little bit uh, you'll see that it puts down a camera node and this will edit our um, the details of where our camera is in the scene its translation and rotation and uh, also the focus distance that's what this control is here as well uh, so you can see that that's all getting saved in this camera node and if I toggle the bypass flag same thing happened as before. So that's kind of how we can, that's how it works between the viewport uh, selections and then transforms being added over here with nodes. So I'm gonna remove this. And let's finally talk about uh, some of the icons on the right side of the screen here, which are uh, toggles for kind of what's visible in our scene. So here, this these glasses change uh, what kind of geometry you're looking at. So whether it's the final render geometry, uh, proxy geometry or proxy and guide geometry, uh, you can select that right here. Now, if you wanted to turn on or off something specific in the scene, uh, these toggles allow you to turn geometry on and off, uh, turn the visibility of your, your light geometry on and off, the camera icon on or off, and then finally the selection. So let's select our geometry here. So we'll select that. And then this last one will toggle this little highlight on or off. Now, there are more icons and controls than the scope of this course will allow, but if you're looking for more help, you can always click the question mark for more information about any specific pain that you come across in the Houdini interface. So now that we've selected and manipulated the primitives in the viewport, let's take a look at how we can save those selections in a couple of different ways. So we're in the example file that I've given you, and there's a section called collections and selection sets. Uh, this top gray subnetwork, if we go inside, has a few nodes that will build just a simple circle of these rubber toys. And if we come to this green node, it will load those toys in uh, from a USD file on disk. So this top one saves out the, um, the file, this one reads it in. So over here, you can see we have um, 11, or sorry, 12 rubber toys in our scene. And I have opened up this little pane down here, extra part of the pane. And this has the place that you can find your collections and selection rules. So first of all, we're gonna talk about selection rules. So let's say we wanted to make a selection rule that would select all of these uh, primitives, all these toy primitives in the scene. What we can do is we can go to this little magnifying glass plus icon, it'll bring up a selection rule dialog, and we can just put in a pattern here that'll select based on the path in our scene. So we'll do forward slash toy circle forward slash and then I'll just do a star to select everything inside of it and that star is just a wild card to say anything after this that has a path that starts with toy circle and is in, is um, parent or child underneath that we can add that to the selection set so I'm going to just say select all toys apply accept we can see that this selection rule has been added. And if we use this uh, little icon, it'll select all of the primitives that are in that selection rule. So that's the first way that we can go about doing it. So let's do another, um, let's select these ones kind of at the, uh, kind of the four, the four cardinal points of this circle. And let's right click on them and in the scene graph tree and say, uh, copy paths. And now we can go into this selection rule and we can go to the pattern and we can paste and that'll paste in those, the paths to those rubber toys. And we can say cardinal points toys, apply, accept. You can see we have those two selection rules down here so we can select all of the toys like we had from before or we can just select the cardinal point toys. And you can see that updates both in the viewport and in our scene graph tree. So finally, let's talk about kind of the quickest way that you could add a selection rule. So I'm just gonna kind of randomly select some toys here, just something, just kind of a random scattering of toys like that. We can see that they're selected in our uh, scene graph tree. And if I use this little down arrow here, 
that will add a selection. And so I can right click on it, hit edit, and I'll just say random toys. And now if we use that selection, it'll, it'll select those and we can kind of move back and forth between these saved uh, selection sets that we have. So that's one way of defining uh, selections in the Solaris interface. Now, the other way we can do that is by using collections, and that's done a little differently. So we have our toy circle right here, this node. Let's uh, tab and add a collection, and we'll drop it down here, make sure it's connected. And here we can see a couple different things that are happening. Um, one, this is going to make a primitive called collections, and then it's going to set a collection name, which is called selected one. Um, I think what I'm going to do instead of that is I am going to uh, call this uh, all toys. And then here we can do the same thing. We're, we're going to do the same thing we did with our selection. Uh, we'll do a forward slash toy circle forward slash and then a star and now this will select all of the um the child uh primitives of toy circle and we're saving this to the collections primitive and we can see here we have a collection i'm just gonna make this a little bigger and that's all toys so if i select that there all toys are selected so now this seems very similar to what we were doing before but there is one big distinction that i want to make between collections and selections the selections are a Houdini specific thing. So that gets saved into the actual project file, whereas the collections get saved to USD files on disk. So that's the real difference between those two. So just keep that in mind while you're working in here. If you wanna pass this along to someone else uh, through a file, you wanna make a collection. And if it's something just for you to work in, a selection rule is a perfectly fine way of doing it. So uh, just something to keep in mind to kind of differentiate between those two. Now let's look at another way to select primitives to use in a collection. So I'm gonna add uh, another collection here that adds a tab to this part. And I'm gonna use this arrow here. Now normally when you select this, this would allow you to uh, select in the viewport and then hit enter. And then it'll bring up uh, those primitives uh, into that box. However, um, if we want a little bit more um, unique way of selecting things, a little bit more uh, control, we can control click on this arrow that'll bring up our select primitives dialog and we can open this up and we can see that we can uh, check all of our hierarchy and find you know really deeply buried primitives in here that we might might want to select um, we can see just basically all of our hierarchy the same way it is in our scene graph tree so i'm going to select a few primitives in here you hold hold down control to multi select and hit apply and okay and then we have those four primitives uh, selected in here. I'm going to call this um, Cardinal Prim Collection. And now down here, I can just see that I have that selection uh, included in there. So that's a way to kind of use the hierarchy of your USD scene uh, by control clicking on this arrow. So let's look at um, one more way that we could define the primitives in in a collection and I will just add another collection here and wire that up. And instead of doing it just typing here, what I can do is I can select a few primitives in the scene, make sure you hit S for selection. And then we'll just make a couple primitives like this, select those toys, great. You can see they're selected in the scene graph tree. And what I'm gonna do is just drag from there and drop them uh, into the uh, dialogue here. And unfortunately, I had this little bit at the beginning here, so I'm just going to remove that and make sure we're, we uh, have just these uh, toy circle rubber toy um, path set. So I'm going to deselect them in the viewport here, and I'm going to call this uh, random toys. We can see here that I can select that, and now my random toys come up. And you can see as well that the original collection that I had is gone because I made this in a separate uh, part of the, the network. If I select this one, now we'll see all toys is there. And if I was to wire these up in series, we should have both of those collections there. So depending on how you might wanna uh, send your collections out to maybe different files and save them on disk, you might wanna have those collection nodes um, 
you know, in a different branch of your, of your uh, tree. But um, this is how you can save uh, collections and selection rules. But let's just say you wanted to do something where you would um, call those back and maybe transform them or do something like that. Well, what we can do is let's take a transform uh, node. We'll put it at the end of this tree here. And now we want to select just those primitives, uh, so maybe just the random toy primitives to translate those up. So the syntax for that is using the percent sign and then typing out random toys like this. And that should select just those, and you can see that there's now a blue highlight around those. And if I wanted to translate them up, Sure enough, I can move them, I could, you know, rotate them however I wanted to, all that kind of stuff. So now we have these random toys uh, that are rotated in our scene and translated. And uh, that is something that uh, is pretty easily accessible here just by using this syntax of percent and then the collection name. So that's how you uh, save both selections and collections uh, in the Solaris interface in Houdini. So in this section, we're going to go over the USD primitive matching syntax, and we'll show you how you can procedurally make collections of primitives. So we're in the example file here, and we're in the primitive matching pattern section. Um, there is a subnetwork here that creates um, our USD geometry. So if we go in here and we want to resave it, we can just select this node at the bottom and hit save to disk. And this green node here will load that USD uh, file from disk. And we'll manipulate that using these transform nodes here to see how we can select different pieces of geometry in this scene. However, first, I want to bring up the help documentation so you can see um, the extensive uh, syntax reference that's in the Houdini documentation. So if you search for primitive matching patterns um, in this uh, in the documentation, it'll bring up this uh, syntax reference and you can see all the different options for searching and narrowing down uh, geometry in your scene. There's quite a bit here, so we obviously won't be able to go through all of it in this video. Um, so let's just look at a few different examples to give you kind of a sense for how this works. So we have this first one that is looking for all of the primitives that are components. So you can see here under kind, all of these primitives here are components. And so it's moving everything in the scene up because they're all components. So that way we're just basically selecting everything in this case. So if we wanted to get a little more specific, we can look at this transform pigs node. And in this one, we're looking at, we're looking for things that are a reference of the sources pig primitive. So if we look down here, we have sources and we have pig. Um, and these six pigs are the references that it, it finds. Um, and so then those get transformed upwards. And those are the only things that are selected. So basically, this way we can say, hey, is there anything that's referencing this one uh, source geometry? And if you find those, we're going to put those into a collection and we'll move them upwards or do whatever um, this node that we're using here is going to do. And then finally, if you want to do something maybe a little bit more random, um, we can use the keep random um, syntax. And in this case, um, it looks through all of the primitives that are children of GeoCircle, which is all these here. And it's going to use a fractional percentage of them, 50% in this case. And we have a seed value here, so we can just you know, change the seed of our random selection here. And so this is a way that you could uh, take a path in your scene graph tree and basically select random uh, children nodes of that or a random um, amount of primitives from a given selection. So that's pretty cool. And we can also extend that a little bit further. So what we can do is let's say we didn't want these Tommies to move up, but we wanted these other ones to be sort of random. Well, what we can do is we can do minus and then do the same reference that we did before. We do colon and I'll do sources forward slash Tommy. And this will keep all of the Tommies from being added into this collection. If instead we wanted to have all of the Tommies plus the random selection, we can change this over to a plus. And then we'll click off of that. And now all the Tommies plus the random other geometry that was um, selected in this first section are moved upwards. So the last thing that we can do is if we wanted to keep uh, take all of the random geometry that was selected at first and only move the Tommies that were in that random selection, we can do an and. And that will take 
just the Tommies that were in that random selection and keep those up. There's two Tommies that weren't in that initial random selection and those stayed down. So these are some different examples to kind of give you a sense for how this syntax works. And then you can go in now and uh, find other examples in that in the reference documentation to be able to kind of do your own uh, selections and uh, procedural collections as you're working with USD. So let's begin to look at how we would import Houdini geometry onto our USD stage in order to eventually write it all out to disk. So we're in our example file and we're looking at the scene import section. And we have a couple different variants here that we're going to kind of go through. But first, let's take a look at the object network. And we'll go into here and click on object. And this will bring us to our object network. And this is kind of what we have set up uh, that we want to import into our stage. And so there's a couple different uh, geometry objects, some lights, and a camera. Nothing too crazy, but just gives us kind of some variation to be able to bring into our USD scene to be able to start working with things. So let's go back to our stage and let's click on this first scene import and we'll see that this is set to scene import all, which if you're using your tab menu, it's just scene import all. We have other options here as well, but we're gonna first look at the scene import all. That's basically what this node is exactly. So, what we're doing here is we're setting um, our root object from as the object network and the destination path is just the root of our stage and you can see that it's bringing in all of our objects right to the root of the stage and the selection of objects is is determined right here by this star wild card so basically that star is saying bring everything that you find at slash obj into this this scene right here into this into the USD stage. So the other thing that we can do is we can filter um, by all object types um, that we can, we'll adjust that in some of these later uh, examples, but for right now we're just filtering all, so everything's coming in. And if we scroll down a little bit here, we can see that we're importing materials as well, and those are going to the destination path slash materials, and that's right in here we have our toy shader. So this is kind of the most basic um, and quick ways to bring everything into your stage. Scene import all, it brings everything in there, kind of just dumps it in and you're good to go. So next let's look at the scene import geo and what's different about that. So in this case, um, we're still using these same um, selections up at the top here, but instead we changed the filter uh, to geometry objects. We could also filter by lights or cameras. Uh, so in this case, if we switched it to lights, it would just bring the lights in. And in this case, uh, it would just bring in the camera. But let's look at just with the geometry objects. So we have our grid and our rubber toy and our scene graph tree here. And the one thing that's interesting is that I intentionally turned off the materials just so you could see how that would look. So we're not actually bringing any materials in here. So say you wanted to add a material um, in USD or in the Solaris tool set, um, you could do that as well. So in this case, I have import materials checked off. And the last option down here, I have it set where we're importing the camera and the lights. And you might be saying, well, hold on a second. We didn't have a filter for camera and lights. They're individually able to be selected, but you can't select them both at the same time. So what I did instead was I filtered by my objects right here. So we can use this little selection uh, uh, dialog and we can select just what specific things we wanna bring in. So we're filtering by all object types, but when we select our lights and our camera and accept that pattern, it'll bring in just um, our lights and cameras into our scene and puts it right there at the root of the, um, the stage. However, a lot of times you might want to control where things are going. So in this case, I'm going to type in lights and just let that um, add a X-form um, primitive at the top level here and group everything underneath it or make these all child primitives of this lights uh, X form primitive. So that's a way that you can kind of organize your scene as you bring it in. So these these different options allow you to kind of select what's coming in from your object uh, network and be able to kind of organize and uh, control the objects that are getting placed onto your stage. Now, another way that we can bring in specific SOP geometry is with the SOP import node. So 
here we are in our demo file again. And if we go back to the object network, we can see the geometry that we're going to reference. So let's go back into our stage. And here um, we can see that we have a SOP import node laid down. Let's select that. And uh, you can see that just the uh, flip or the rubber toy geometry is brought in. So let's look at why that's happening in the parameters. So the SOP path is set to object rubber toy out toy geo, which is a null that I created inside. So let's just look at that real quick and we can see sure enough, there's our object level. We're looking at the rubber toy and there's our out toy geo. So just make sure that's accepted. So that's just bringing in this one single piece of geometry here. And um, so let's look at how this is being brought into our, our scene graph tree. So here we have an import path prefix that's saying it's uh, forward slash dollar sign OS. And what dollar sign OS means is the name of the node that is doing uh, the importing, which here says get sop rubber toy. So the import path prefix is get sop rubber toy. And we can see right here that that's being written and there's a mesh underneath that as well. So if I change this to something like import geo, this will update to say import geo, or if I wanted to do something like, like rubber toy, that'll update as well. And so now we have that maybe a little bit more specifically named. The other thing uh, that we can do is we can add a uh, just another uh, primitive in front of that. So say we did something like geometry forward slash OS. We'll see now that we have geometry rubber toy mesh zero. And just like in some of the previous examples that we, we were talking about, this is just a way to be able to group things a little bit easier. Um, and this is an X form primitive and you can see that this is uh, the kind is group. So that's why it looks a little different here. But um, that's kind of a way that you can control how your hierarchy is in your scene graph tree. The one last thing I want to touch on in this node is the copy contents into editable layer. Um, if this is off, it'll give you a little error right here and or just a warning more or less. And that's just basically talking about some um, some stuff that we're going to learn later on with layering. But um, just know that for at this point, um, checking that box will make sure that it brings everything in properly to your USD stage. And then uh, when the time comes to write that to disk, it'll be written properly. So now let's look at how we can create geometry directly on the stage from scratch using the SOP create node. So in our example file, we have this SOP create section and we're going to dive inside of this node right here. So now you can see that we're in the geometry context of Houdini and I'm going to switch over to a geometry spreadsheet so we can see a little bit better what's going on here. So these are just some basic uh, SOP nodes and we are going to just kind of look through here. We can see that there's some points scattered. We're copying in some lines to those points, uh, add some noise and scale, and then finally we sweep um, those lines to create some spikes. And then here we add the name attribute spikes to all of our primitives. On the other side, we are just doing, uh, adding some gray color to our grid and then adding the uh, name attribute grid. Those get merged, add some normals, and then we output them. So this is a fairly basic uh, scene as far as uh, scenes go in Houdini. It's just some simple geometry uh, just to kind of show something interesting. So now when we get back to um, our Solaris um, view and look at our scene graph tree here, we'll also set our display flag, we can now see that there's two meshes that are coming in here. One is grid and one is spikes. So those name attributes that we created in, in our SOP create node are actually coming in as separate mesh geometry or mesh primitives in our scene graph tree. So obviously that's really important because we can, we can select the spikes, we could select the grid, uh, and then do something like just transform one of those and that'll drop down an edit node. Um, so pretty important thing to kind of note there when you're working uh, in SOPs and want to bring in your geometry. Um, so the SOP create node is more or less the same as the previous node we looked at, the SOP import node, has more or less the same properties. However, it adds on the ability to transform all your geometry here or uh, import materials if you had some in your SOP network. In addition to that, um, 
the import path prefix is the same where it's set to dollar sign OS. So if we take the name of this node, uh, that will be written to this primitive right here that the meshes are grouped underneath. So if we change this to spiked grid, it'll change inner scene graph tree to spiked grid and those uh, grid and spikes will remain the same. And we could also hard code this if we wanted to. So we do slash geometry uh, and we'll cool spiked grid and there we have a uh, geometry x form then our cool spiked grid uh, component and then our two meshes below that so that's just a real quick look at how you can create some geometry uh, in your sop create node and then bring it directly into solaris to begin working with it uh, in usd so up to this point we've talked about bringing in geometry from the object context into Solaris to manipulate as USD, but we haven't specifically talked about how to write out files as USD um, in this Solaris context. So in this section, I'd like to just touch on that and kind of get, give us an idea for how we can do that uh, quickly and easily uh, in Solaris. So, so here we are, uh, we have three um, of the nodes that we've worked on previously, the scene import, uh, SOP import, and SOP create. All these, uh, as we go through them, we can see that it's the same um, objects that we had created before. And I just want to talk about how these get written to disk. So um, we have these USD ROPs down here at the bottom. And these are all basically written exactly the same, um, except for one slight difference here where we're basically just flattening everything when they come in from the scene import node. Uh, that's just because of some spe uh, specific things that we'll get to later when we talk about layering. Um, but um, it just helps it to save without throwing any errors or anything like that. So um, that's the only difference between these. And these are all just saving to a path as dollar sign OS, which is taking the name of these ROP nodes and writing them into USD uh, a file path. So um, what we can do is we can highlight all these, hit save to disk. It'll run all the, the um, ROPs real quick, write them, and um, we can take a look at exactly where these are. So these are in a folder uh, writing to disk here that I made, and here are the different files. Uh, we can see that the um, the scene import and SOP import, because they're similar, are roughly about the same size, but this um, SOP create um, USD is way bigger and that's mostly because of how much geometry is made in here so we can really quickly see how fast uh, these files can grow without maybe having them saved as a uh, a binary definition so let's just do that real quick we'll just take usd uh, a off the end and save it to disk and we can take a look at um, the difference in file size we get there. Uh, now this one we can't actually open up and look at, um, but you can see the file, the uh, difference there is about a four times reduction. Now that's not always going to be a four times reduction, but um, in, a, in an object like this with a lot of geometry uh, points and things like that, it certainly is going to give you some savings. So let's just pop these open real quick and take a look at what's going on in here. So first of all, here's the scene import. And like we'd expect, we see some uh, few high level objects here like area light, cam, environment light, grid. Um, and as we scroll down, we see there's a bunch of stuff for our grid and some lights. And then here's the rubber toy and it has a ton of uh, information on it. If we go to the SOP import, we really only have the one object in there, uh, which is this uh, mesh zero. And then later on will be the rubber toy. Um, and so that's pretty much um, all that's in here is just the, just these couple pieces of geometry. And if we go to the SOP create ROP, uh, this one's a little different because it has the, um, the mesh and the, um, the spikes that are in there. And so from that um, object, we can see that there's a ton of different um, attributes that are saved in here. And while it seems like this is smaller, just the way that this is displaying, it actually isn't wrapping uh, these lines. So there's actually a ton more um, data in here than in either of those other uh, USDA files. So um, so that's the basic idea of how we take um, our geometry in and then write them out uh, using the USD ROP uh, in order to make USD files on disk. In this last chapter of the course, I'd like to 
to kind of take a sidetrack a little bit and do something that's a little more visually interesting and something that we can kind of uh, learn about how to actually render some images and output them from Solaris using some of these uh, USD concepts that we've uh, we've learned so far. So let's take a look here. Um, we have two um, two nodes in this import and render with karma section. Uh, the top one is a sub network. We can just glance at that real quick. It's got some nodes in it that'll build up this scene for us, but really all we're gonna do is just load up this um, USD file, simple render scene uh, via a sub layer node. And you can see over here, we've got some camera, we got a camera, we've got some geometry, we have some lights, and we also have shaders in here. So how do we take this all and render it. So in our viewport um, up here, you can see that we have our Houdini uh, GL viewport right here. And you go down to this next uh, location here to be able to start up Karma. So from this standpoint, um, it's gonna load up your geometry in the scene and begin rendering. And we should start seeing some uh, results back in a moment. There we go. So now we can move around in our viewport see our karma um, materials and shaders and everything. Um, and we can also select our camera if we wanted to, and that'll send us right uh, into that camera view. Now, obviously this is just the viewport. And so the question then is, is how do we get this actually out to disk? So I'm gonna go back to our GL viewport so that we're not rendering. And let's go into our network here and go tab karma. And so when we drop this down, we're gonna get two nodes. This is something new to 19.5. So if you're, um, if you're used to um, Houdini 19, uh, you'll only have one node in there. This is kind of the new way of doing it in here. So we're gonna input our stage into here. And this node controls all of our Karma settings. Um, and the lower node down here will actually uh, render things out to disk, to mplay, um, or to disk in background. So uh, here we can actually, um, you know, just basically this will run whatever is set in our karma render settings node. I'm just gonna separate these a little bit so we can see them a little better. And here you can see that, oops, let me go back here. I just accidentally clicked something there. Um, here you can see we've got our output picture um, where these render settings are getting saved. And you can see now we have a primitive in our scene graph tree that has some information here about rendering. And um, it also sets our camera, uh, a bunch of other um, you know rendering based um, settings down here, but we can more or less just use um, our default settings here just to be able to get something out. So actually, I'm going to set this back to 720, make sure it's not trying to go too, too far. Um, so let's select our Karma Render settings. And when we come up here, uh, we can actually see that there's a drop down now here, or a, a little pop out that has viewport settings or our default uh, location, or you can select, if you had multiple render settings, you can select those here. So we're just gonna say default to make sure that that's working. We'll go back to Karma, let this start loading up. And uh, now this node is driving all of our uh, render settings. So this is how you would render something out uh, directly uh, in the viewport. And then down here, if we wanted to save it to disk, or let's in this case say render to mplay, we could just click on this it's going to load up and play for us. And that will begin rendering right in that viewer. This will load up. And now we're going to see some uh, buckets return and we can get to get a glimpse of what this render looks like um, in M play. And so this is a pretty simple way to use a couple of nodes to write out images uh, directly from Karma. Um, there's obviously a lot of render settings in this node. Um, we're not going to get into all of those. This isn't a course on rendering, uh, but you can see you get a pretty nice quality result right here and fast. So this shows us how we can get quality final images uh, out from Solaris using Karma and how the viewport rendering works here. Obviously, this is a pretty, pretty, um, responsive viewport that we can move around in. Um, we could also uh, lock ourselves to the camera, and then when we move around, it'll actually keep us in that camera view uh, as we tumble around through our scene. And so this is a pretty quick um, way to to see your results back. And you can see here, as I move that camera, it 
added a little edit camera node there as well. So um, if you're interested in playing around with, say, the um, XPU engine, you can select that right here, which is still uh, in alpha, but is getting more and more features uh, every release. So hopefully this is something for you to be able to just kind of get a sense of how these things are rendered. Um, and uh, yeah, going forward, you'll be able to take anything that we might learn um, in these, these USD courses and start to uh, put together how to actually get the visuals out uh, from Solaris. Thank you so much for watching this course on USD with Solaris. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to contact us. Thanks again.